So welcome to session two, where we're going to be talking about what regional extension can look like in practice. And so this session introduces two examples of how research, monitoring, and collaboration can lead to decision support tools that help BC farmers and ranchers make informed management decisions as they navigate the changing conditions that are coming up with climate change. So both of the projects that are going to be presented today actually started under, under the climate change adaptation programming and have continued on under the new regional extension program. Uh, both projects address very specific issues. The first uh, is focusing on access to forage and livestock surface water, the second around salinity and delta irrigation water. Uh, but you'll see in some ways their approaches have been um, somewhat similar. And while they're offering different tools, um, the approach there has some has some parallels. So we're going to jump right in. Um, in the first presentation today, Andrew Pantel from Pantel Environmental Consulting is going to be talking about landscape and range resiliency planning tools. Um, this is a climate change modeling and surface water risk assessment tool that incorporates a forage productivity database. Uh, that's a lot of uh, jargoning words, but Andrew's going to break it down for us in an accessible way. Um, and then the second presentation, so you know where we're heading, is going to be Andrew Nadler from Peak Hydromet Solutions, and he's going to be discussing the Delta Water and Salinity Monitoring Program um, that was established to address the irrigation water challenges faced by Delta farmers. After each of the two presentations, we're going to have time for Q&A. So you can start typing your questions into the Q&A box um, as the presenters are speaking. And you will also have that upvote option. So if you see a question there you want to see answered, upvote it, and we'll move it up in the acorn. Uh, sorry, up into the up the queue. Uh, again, the session is going to be recorded, so we will be sharing it afterwards. Um, yeah, so with that, I'm pleased to introduce our first, our first Andrew of the day, Andrew Pantel. Um, he is a rangeland ecologist and owner operator of Pantel Environmental Consulting. He's based uh, in Saskatchewan, but has spent much, much time working here in, in British Columbia. Um, he's been working in range management in BC as an agrologist, rain, range practices specialist and consultant since 2005. Uh, welcome, Andrew. It's great to have you here today. Thank you, Shauna. Um, I am going to try to keep on track with time, so I've got my stopwatch started here. Um, yeah, so I am presenting on just uh, some stuff here. So the water and forage uh, resiliency projects that I'm working on with the BC Cattlemen's Association. Um, and a brief outline, I'll just kind of go through the background of the project. Uh, incorporating climate change into range management, and we'll look at uh, what climate model that, that we're using and some of the assumptions that we have for, for at-risk wetlands, as well as looking at linking our forage resources to the water resources, and that's sort of uh, the backbone of, of the management aspect of this. And uh, I'll go through a few of the next steps, what we're, what we're working on currently in, in terms of some specific projects, along with a few conclusions, and then uh, have some time for some questions. So this project started off in the Caribou Regional District as a surface water risk assessment. So trying to look at uh, what surface water is at risk to future climate change scenarios and, and at risk meant to, to livestock. So where are there going to be uh, situations where we're gonna have water shortages in either climate change scenarios or in, in years of drought? And this report from 2017 led to uh, a workshop with some producers, which led to uh, three uh, pilot projects that were implemented and monitored, and then a final pilot project demonstration where we went uh, to the different areas where we did some water developments and, and went through those with producers as well as um, regional agrologists and, and a number of other folks that uh, wanted to attend those, those demonstrations. The key findings that came out of that were the driest regions, uh, the interior dug fir zones are most at risk within the caribou, and that was what was already sort of known, of course. Um, but then we wanted to sort of see what, what can we accomplish with that knowledge that we, we got from the climate modeling process in terms of how, how we identified surface water that was at risk, and then how do we incorporate that or scale it down to a, to something that's usable at uh, a range unit or pasture pasture level. And that was that's sort of what I, I identify as the biggest challenge. We have these 
these climate models that give us these broad uh, challenges or, or problems or things that are, are happening, but then how do we how do we turn that into something that we can use for management recommendations? So the purpose of the, the current pilot projects for the forage and water resiliency is, is livestock on the range, they need water and they need the forage. And so how do we identify and link those two resources up? And how do we identify the risks to water in future climate change scenarios and drought years? And, and how do we identify the shifts or the change in forage that's associated with less water throughout the grazing season, as well as uh, the forage that that could potentially change with changing uh, climate in terms of if we have shifts in Beck and how that's going to um, influence forage production going forward. And, and part of this is also to promote collaboration and, and conservation through communication. And, and that's sort of some jargon that I pulled out of uh, one of my favorite podcasts, which is the, the Art of Range. And, and so just to promote discussion around uh, range management issues and then and then how how can we work to to solve some of those so we 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 want and we desire long term sustainability of the range resource and we want to be able to incorporate multiple users of rangelands into the discussions around uh, livestock use and and range management on public lands so the original um, climate model included an assessment of what is what is considered an at-risk water body or wetland. And there's a relationship between surface area and volume of a pond in, in grasslands. And it's, it's not a, a perfect relationship, but it works pretty well for ponds that are less than seven hectares in size, less than 10 hectares in size even. Um, and then kind of once you get over areas that are over 40 hectares in size, then the, the relationship really falls apart. But for those, for those smaller, wetlands there there is a relationship between volume and area and so we can use that that knowledge to assess what the uh, climate change predictions and drought years are showing for uh, evaporation and how the water balance and how the water budget is is influencing the size and the volume of these ponds um, moving through a grazing season or moving through a a summer or a year of, of evaporation uh, so generally, we, we use the same uh, climate models that, that, are, that are recommended by um, those who, who are involved in climate uh, management in BC. And, and the majority of our scenarios that we look at are the 2050s scenario. And so we compare stuff from the 2020s or from the current scenario to the 2050s climate scenario. And, and that's just what is considered um, uh, best practice in, in BC. So we use Climate BC for all our, our current and future climate data. Um, I should have updated this slide. The latest is, uh, so the latest is 20, I think 2023 data comes out sometime in March here. And so then we'll update our, uh, our models using that data. And we generally use a 15 GCM with the RCP of 4.5. So that's sort of a mid range uh, projection. Um, Lots of folks are leaning towards using the 8.5, which is which is a more, I guess, a serious scenario. Um, but we've we've generally we'll stick with the 4.5 um, scenario. And so what it's provided for us is, or how we've we've taken the 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 climate projections for evaporation and precipitation is. Is we've applied them to for a water budget for each individual pond within the IDF. So we do have these these tables for all the ponds uh, in in the pro most pretty much in the province. You can you can pick any pond and, and you can build one of these tables. And what it does is it allows us to estimate what the uh, the the starting area is and then what happens to that pond. Uh, each month as it is under the uh, influences of evaporation and, and precipitation, and then also compare that to what is projected to happen to that uh, pond in future in future years. And so as a pond, as it, as it evolves through a, a season, uh, ponds that change from in an area of more than 50% or of a volume of more than 50%, we consider those being at risk. And generally that, that those ponds are, are 
they start off at the start of the year under five hectares, they're between two and five hectares, and, and they reduce in size by about over 50% throughout the, throughout the season. And, and although it's a fairly arbitrary number of just saying 50%, it, it generally provides a pretty good indication of what's happening to uh, water quality in terms of, as, as there's more evaporation, you get reduced water quality as, as especially if you're in areas that have any amount of uh, salinity, uh, but you also get reduced quantity of water. And so uh, the ponds shrink, they become harder to access for livestock. And as they shrink, the water quality reduces. And that is also an issue for, for livestock health. We've seen situations in uh, Saskatchewan where um, under where there's been severe drought in late season. And in previous years, there wasn't drought and, and the ponds were available to livestock and, and they had access to to reasonable quality water, but then in drought years, uh, the salinity gets so high due to increases in concentration following evaporation that the water becomes uh, toxic. And there was a, a community pasture in southern Saskatchewan about four or five years back that um, they didn't check the cows for two or three days, and and they lost two hundred head uh, just on just because of of poor water. And so it, there is an implication for um, for livestock with quality as well as quantity. So you can appreciate that as, as uh, ponds shrink in size, they, they become uh, a greater risk, not only to the ecology of the pond, but also to livestock themselves as they have to go further in uh, to, get, to get water. And so trying to identify these areas that are on the left and create, come up with management recommendations or solutions um, to limit their access or to create better footing going further out is, is one of the situations that we can look at. But, um, drought and climate change scenarios generally um, have a risk to surface water. There's also implications for, for ecosystem services, so identifying which of these wetlands are going to dry up. Um, this information can be used for all kinds of things, whether it's species at risk or uh, habitat management um, and, and things like that. So the challenge is taking that climate model and breaking it down to a, a range a range unit scale or a pasture scale, and then coming up with management recommendations to create a resilient range unit that has reliable water throughout the grazing season. And that can be by protecting highly at risk wetlands or by creating new water developments in certain locations that uh, as, as appropriate. <clears throat> so generally how we can plan to do this is uh, livestock will, are influenced by distance to water as well as, as by the amount of forage that's available for them. And so um, in most situations, livestock will travel about a kilometer and a half from reliable water to forage, to, to get their forage requirements. And, and so an entire range unit isn't necessarily, even though there's forage throughout it, it's not necessarily available for livestock. There's we have to sort of consider this distance of one and a half kilometers from reliable water, that that's actually the area that they'll graze. And if the resiliency of a water body changes, then that area that is accessible for grazing is reduced. And so what we end up getting is we generally have two areas on the landscape. So we have the area in dark that is associated with reliable, resilient water. So that are associated with large larger ponds and larger wetlands. And then we have the area that's in the lighter zone that's uh, associated with um, less resilient water or smaller ponds. And so in future climate change scenarios or in drought years, those areas that are, that are associated with the smaller ponds are not accessible for grazing just because there's no water in them. And uh, it's, it's trying to um, create resilient water in those zones that don't have water that is, that is the, uh, man the management challenge. And so when we think about climate change and drought planning, uh, focusing on the water resources and on the forage resources, we also have to consider where the most valuable forage is. And so we use both the forage category map as well as a, uh, a, a map that shows where the resilient water is. So the resilient water is highlighted in green on the map on the left and, and the uh, threatened areas are in red on the left. And then also we, we bring in something called the flow accumulation map, which I'll, I'll talk about soon here. So 
within each forage category, uh, the amount of forage that's available is, is dependent on sort of the type of plant community, for lack of a better term, or, or the canopy closure or the cover. And so we can use broad categories. These, these categories aren't set in stone by any means, but they're the categories that, that I've used uh, quite frequently in the past. And so we need to identify where the highest amount of forage is um, or, or just what the forage is within these circles to identify how much forage is available for livestock to eat. And so we break up the little polygons within these zones of use or the one and a half kilometers from water. And, and then that allows us to apply a kilograms per hectare of forage uh, to the landscape. And then that can be used to, um, I guess, estimate what production is. And so if we have an aspen leading category, it changes depending on what Beck zone it is, but we have these numbers available now based on uh, about 1,250 clipping points. One of the challenges with forage production is, change, is the shift in, in the Beck zones associated with, with climate change projections. And so we need to start looking at how the potential forage categories are going to change in future climate ch change scenarios and then have two sets of numbers. So we have our current forage uh, numbers available, and then we'll have our future uh, potential forage numbers available. And that's uh, useful for, for range management because we're generally planning on uh, decade cycles or, or you know, lifetime of a, of a ranch or, or um, quite long-term term planning is necessary for viable ranching. And so we have a forage table that's like this that allows us to start building um, building what our potential allocations could be based on based on our, our distance to water and based on our forage categories. And I, I've done other uh, webinars in the past just on this table. So it's it's quite extensive. Uh, it's quite a lot of uh, information here. And I'm just just bringing it up for this for the purpose of this talk. But um, I do have more information on this on this table if if uh, people are interested. So the one thing that's missing from our current model is, so not all surface water is closed basin. So our model is, 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 is making the assumption that the ponds are closed basin and so they're not influenced by inflows and outflows. However, many of the wetlands are connected uh, through, through surface and subsurface flow. And generally these areas are more reliable. So we use what's called the flow accumulation model to try and identify which locations on the landscape have connection or which ponds in the landscape have connection to subsurface and, and above ground surface flow. And this can give us an indication of other areas that may have either potential for water developments or may be more resilient that we can add to the forage base to, to acknowledge uh, all of the water that is actually available. And a flow accumulation model is kind of a unitless uh, thing. So it doesn't necessarily say how much water is flowing into one uh, area, all it does is it says how much of a basin, how much of the watershed basin is flowing into a specific flow point or pore point. And it, it, is a, it allows to make comparisons within similar landscapes as to which area has potentially more water versus which areas have less water. And so we can take the trim layer from, uh, or any kind of a watershed mapping layer, and then we can apply the flow accumulation to that to show us um, you know, the, the zones of green are the highest flow, flowing uh, areas and the zones of red would be considered more the ephemeral drainages or the headwaters. And this can be used to identify potential points for, for water developments and or, and or water storage locations, especially if they're outside of these existing uh, zones of reliable water. And so one of the projects that we did in the Caribou was uh, the Guy Mountain range unit where uh, we identified this section at the top end or the north end of the range unit as having very little reliable water. And so we put in three water developments at each of the orange locations, uh, two solar systems and one, and one scoop out. And uh, that now provides uh, water for about an additional maybe 18 hectares. 1800 hectares of, of rangeland that's all in this fairly open, open forest um, type category. And so it, it's fairly high value forage production. And then it also allows for um, improved management of, of the livestock. 
Uh, our current current projects that we're working on. So we're trying to we're working within Churn Creek with uh, some grad students with from BCIT to look at um, and as well as friends of Churn Creek uh, who have pisometers installed in many of the wetlands out there and um, identifying how our flow accumulation lines show up or are usable to identify which ponds are reliable. And, and so we overlay the flow accumulation model with the field data that they have with the piezometers to see um, if there's any uh, patterns that we can find. Uh, also, we're assessing some forage production post-fire out there with BCIT, and that's gonna assist with this pond evolution uh, through the grazing season. They're also doing some um, on the infield measurements of the area, and then we're comparing those to the model. Um, we want to be able to use a flow accumulation model to better predict what may be resilient and what may be threatened. And we also want to use this to begin to look at watershed hydrology, identify uh, what data collection uh, is, is required to, to um, improve that, that flow accumulation model and to identify potential locations for water storage and water developments, uh, especially as they're related to um, livestock grazing. So here's an example of the Churn Creek where they have uh, Pismometers located at these locations. And so we're able to overlay the flow accumulation model with those. Uh, other ways that we've used the, the information for the, for the water and forage resiliency project is uh, overlaying uh, elk use or wildlife use. And that's all the, the little spots on the left with, with zones of use for livestock. And then it, it facilitates conversations around uh, the interactions of, of wildlife and, and livestock, as well as uh, overlaying those zones of use with rangeland health assessments and seeing which areas or, or which wetlands are most at risk based on, on use patterns and then species at risk and how livestock use can potentially influence uh, species at risk by, by showing where livestock use is related to species at risk and then not develop, potentially not developing water in those areas that are that are uh, high value species at risk, especially where a species at risk may be sensitive to livestock use. Um, so in conclusion, this brings uh, the forage inventory and areas of use to the table discussing land use. It helps managers efficiently plan mitigation strategies and infrastructure strategies. It helps stratify the, oh, um, I'm not. Uh, helps stratify the, the landscape to assist with rangeland health assessments, provides information needed for carrying capacity, and uh, most importantly, I think facilitates discussion and provides an interface to display what the forage resource is, um, demonstrating where potential conflict or potential uh, opportunities are. And questions and discussion, there's my acknowledgements. Um, thank you for all the support and, and the funding from, from these groups, as well as, uh, and especially the support that I've received from the BC Cattlemen's Association. Thank you, Andrew. Oh. You did a great job staying on time and really breaking down quite a complex project with a lot of uh, analysis involved. So we've already gathered some excellent questions um, in the Q&A. If you have questions, please type them in there now. We will have a few minutes to answer them. Um, I'm going to start with a couple of questions that came up when you were talking about the climate change modeling data that you're using. Um, the first is why would you choose to use RCP 4.5 over 8.5? Um, you know, just kind of given the trajectory um, that we're on. So do you want to just speak to that and why that's sort of been the- Sure. Um, so when we originally made the selection, it was in 2017 and that's what, and and that, and that's what, so that's what we selected. We, we can also, but it's been brought to our attention more and more frequently every time we do a presentation that we should be using 8.5. And um, I think we, we can use that. And I don't, there, there's no reason why we've, we've really chosen why, why we're not. And, and we, we, we should, because as you're, as you're pointing out, uh, we are going to likely exceed that, um, that scenario. So, yeah, uh, it's might easy be enough to, run. to see that kind of comparison too, um, to see what the what the impact would be. Right. Um, so mm -hmm. another question just related to that in some ways, do any of your projections show increases in forage in certain 
zones as a result of climate change? Yes, so especially where we get, uh, sometimes when we get the shifts from uh, SDS into ICH or IDF, um, the based on the, the limited data that we have, and I say limited, there's still 1,250 points, but um, it is limited in terms of, that's all through the province. Uh, we, do, we do see some situations where we will have uh, increases in forage based on, um, there'll be increases in the amount of open, open range categories versus, versus closed force categories in some of the IDF, as well as increases in open force categories versus closed force categories in, in IDF. And some of the IDF, as it switches to um, the ponderosa pine, uh, Beck, then we also see increases in forage in the open forest categories. And so that is definitely, um, potentially we are, we are seeing that. And then even with future, with, with the wildfire situations, post burn, we often get, you know, three years or four years past post burn, you know, especially in open forest categories, we are seeing, um, yeah, we are seeing a, a increase in in forage uh, associated with those categories. So that when we incorporate burning. Yeah, okay. So I'm gonna to try to ask two more questions um, and then we'll move on to the next presentation. But people can keep putting in their questions in the Q&A and Andrew can um, answer by type. Um, so the first question is around uh, any expected outcomes of diversion of water um, in an anticipated drought by BC Hydro. So. Uh, you know, they might be moving water for electricity or for salmon conservation, uh, for example. So is that something that you've factored in at all? Uh, well, I guess not necessarily factored in. It's it's something that we would like to use the flow accumulation model to assist with, to show. It's something that we would like to use a flow accumulation model to assist with. So we, we would like to, to use it to sort of show where on the landscape uh, flow was coming from and and where it's important for livestock use on crown land and have that as um, it, it helps us with the ability to, to have the conversations around where this where this type of stuff could be potentially happening or where there's uh, flows being diverted and, and how that can influence um, livestock use I guess so so it's it's not incorporated but it is something that I feel like should be, it allows us to have that conversation mm -hmm. around where uh, livestock use and, and water use overlap. Yeah, uh, which is hugely important. Easy. Yeah, excellent. Okay, so maybe just one last question I'm gonna leave you with here is around um, solutions like riparian management, like fencing, for example, or improving storage ability of, of the wetlands through human intervention or beaver dams. Um, are those types of interventions to improve the resiliency of livestock surface water being uh, considered? Yeah, yes, I would say that's what 90% of what, what this is, what the management recommendations are that come out of this is which area, which wetlands to uh, require additional fencing or point access and also where um, specific riparian management is necessary to, uh, to either uh, facilitate livestock use or to remove livestock use in some situations. And, and by remove, I mean remove from the, from the riparian areas and from, from the wetlands. But um, it's, it's been very useful in a couple of range units in terms of uh, supporting management decisions to create point access and fencing off large, quite large wetlands and creating point access on them to protect the wetland and to still provide water for livestock. Great, thank you for that very informative uh, presentation, Andrew. Um, there's lots of uh, resources on these projects. So if people want to find out more information, um, you can follow those links. Again, we'll share them in a follow-up email. You can also reach out to Andrew himself um, if you have specific questions or wanna know how to um, find out more about the project and the new, the current projects underway related to this. So thanks again. Um, I'm gonna ask you to stop sharing your screen and we're going okay. to go to our next Andrew of the morning, um, Andrew Nadler. So if anyone has come to another uh, weather station related um, 
uh, webinar that ACARN has hosted. You will have met Andrew Nadler before. He is a professional agrologist and agricultural meteorologist who's worked with weather, climate, and water monitoring networks in Western Canada and internationally. Um, his role as owner of Peak Hydromet Solutions, he collaborates closely with many organizations and farms uh, across BC and is helping them enhance their sustainability and resilience through the application of new technologies and innovative solutions. So he's uh, one of those people who can make technology work for, um, <laughs> for those of us that are a little less tech savvy and has a knack for uh, making it seem simple. So welcome, Andy. It's great to have you here this morning. And um, yeah, I'll let you introduce the Delta Project. All right. Thanks, Shauna. Um, yeah, as you're saying how I'm good with technology, I'm just praying that my presentation works and I don't screw up on Zoom here, so they're all good, assuming you can hear me right now. Um, appreciate uh, being invited um, by ACARN. Um, I'm always, um, always welcome the opportunity to share information about projects like this because, um, you know, we, we work a lot with farmers, but um, to share it with the with the scientific community, with the larger agricultural community is really great. Particularly with this one, the, uh, the Delta Farmers Institute is a, a fantastic organization uh, with some great um, committed farmers that are, you know, I've, I've really gotten to know over the years. Um, but the other piece of it that I really like about this project is it is extremely farmer led. Everything, everything to do with this project is um, it's working with with the advisor group, and um, it's basically what the farmers want to see. So I really like that because it it it, it ends up with a project that's uh, you know that's really tailored to what to what they want. Um, so I'm going to move ahead. I see that Andrew was exactly on time, and um, Sean has threatened us that if we that if we go over time, bad things will happen. So I'm going to move along. Um, so just to get a little bit of context now, the the area that I'm working in here, it's it's the Delta area of BC. I'm sure everyone is somewhat familiar with it, um, and that it's you know it's just south of Vancouver. You've maybe driven through it, um, maybe gone I don't know berry picking or something in that area. But um, just in the context of BC, um, if you see where it is, and what I've outlined here is the watershed or the the drainage basin of the Fraser River, and as you can see, it's massive. It it encompasses um, pretty much from the Alberta border down to um, down to where it spills out to the Pacific Ocean right at right at Delta. So um, it just shows that it is a huge area that uh, that flows in through the Fraser River. Now, if we look at um, the Delta area specifically, the one thing you can see is there's a lot of agricultural land. So basically everything south of the Fraser River here is um, a huge percent of agricultural land and most of it is irrigated. So it relies heavily on irrigation water. And as you can see where it is, most of it, or at least uh, the southern and the western areas of it are surrounded by ocean. So that's salt water, so not really appropriate for irrigation. So really you have the Fraser River on the north side of it, which are, which are the main, which is the main source of water for irrigation. Now, for Delta specifically, there's a few main intake points where the water comes into the canals. Now, the first one is, uh, it's a pump station. It was built a few years ago, it's called Tasker. And it, it draws water straight out of the river um, and it, it brings it through the canals uh, throughout the system. And then there's a number of other in, intake points, which are most of them are gravity fed. So when the water's high enough, it'll feed in. Some of them do have pumps. But basically what it does is it, it brings the water into the series of canals. There's about 200 plus kilometers of canals through the area. Um, and for irrigating, basically the farmers, they will, um, they'll draw water from these canals. Some of them, say for cranberry growers, they'll, um, they'll put it into ponds where then they would put it into their fields, but a lot of them, they'll, they'll irrigate straight from these canals. Um, one thing to note with these is, is you see the, the, the picture in the bottom left of just a typical canal, um, with water and they're, they're, they're also used for drainage during all well, this time of year in the, in the winter and spring. But there's a certain capacity in all of these. You see the, the edges, if the water goes up, probably maybe a meter or so here, the water is gonna go over the, over the banks of the canal, flood the field. So there is only a certain capacity within, within these waterways. Now, if we go back to the Fraser River for a second, um, this is the flow of the Fraser River over, well, since, um, like I said, yeah, since 1912. So past 110 years or so of the flow. And you can see it's a very, it, it's it's kind of a consistent pattern. Um, if we are to uh, turn it into a hydrograph, we can see that um, from January through about May, the, 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 the flow is very low. 
And then um, into May, so basically the spring freshet, the flow starts to increase and then it peaks right around um, kind of that mid June area and then it decreases through the season. Um, I've identified a few of the, uh, the flows, the peak medium flow, you don't have to remember these numbers, but I'll, I'll return to them in a second. But uh, the 7,000, roughly 7,000 cubic meters per second, and then the lowest flow, the base flow uh, through winter, it's around that 500 meters, um, cubic meters per second. So there's a lot of water that flows through here. So from the spring freshet, we have the, uh, the base flow basically goes into the increasing capacity or the increasing flow. And through that spring freshet, as the peak flow decreases, it corresponds quite nicely with that typical irrigation period. Um, within a lot of areas BC, um, the irrigation starts, you know, maybe early June, depending on the season, it might be the start of June, mid June, late June, it goes through August. By the end of August, uh, most crops are starting to get harvested. So that's kind of that peak season where the water is needed. Um, so as you can see, the flow really corresponds with that, with that um, the irrigation season. Now, if you take a look at those, um, those flow values, those cubic meters per second, if we look at it just from a scale point of view, um, so if we are looking at that base flow, that 500 cubic meters per second, if we look what the pumping capacity is into those canals, so that Tasker pump station um, that you can see in the middle there, that picture, it can, it can pump up to about 337,000 cubic meters per day. But as I mentioned, the canals themselves have a certain, um, certain capacity. So the canal conveyance capacity, it's about 175 cubic meters per day. So what we have is if we were to pump full time at the maximum canal conveyance capacity, if we look at the full Fraser River flow, we're looking at about 0.4% during the low flow time, so that base flow, but during the summer, it's about 0.03%. So all this to, to really demonstrate that what actually gets taken out of the river at this point, it's, you know, it's less than a percent, less than a half percent, really. So it's, uh, you know, literally a drop in the bucket. So what I want to demonstrate here is in this case and other, unlike a lot of watersheds where water is getting extracted from rivers, it's really not a capacity issue. There's a ton of water, literally, like there's just a lot of water. So it's not really, it's not really a shortage of water in this case. Now, the issue though is the water quality. So if we look at that freshet period, so that spring melt period when the, when the flow is good, we go throughout the Fraser River and we measure all along, which is what we're doing, I'll show you in a second, most of the water is excellent quality. It's, it's spring water, it's, uh, you know, it's com coming from the mountains. The salinity content is very low. It's excellent for irrigation, no issues. And even when you look down into that, that part that spills around into the, into the ocean, even this area that you, know, you could you consider this ocean water, it's actually fresh and it's good for irrigation just because you have the flow of the Fraser River pushing that water. So you're basically getting good water for irrigation. Now that's in the springtime and into the summer, the typical summertime. Now, when we look at our base flow, so that 500 uh, cubic meters per second, so during the winter, like this time of year, for instance, what happens is there's not a lot of flow in the river. So the saline water, especially at high tide, it pushes up the, up the channel. So it's, it's um, also referred to the salt wedge, but basically, if we go throughout the river and take measurements, we see that the, the water salinity content up the river is very salty. Um, fortunately, a lot of the time during base flow right now, it doesn't matter. Nobody's irrigating crops. It only really matters during the irrigation period. So I mentioned the salt wedge. So what essentially is happening is as the ocean is pushing up the channel, uh, salt water is more dense than fresh water. So it is actually forming a wedge. It stays below. So there is a stratification where the fresh water is more on top, the salty water is below, and it does form a wedge up the, uh, up the channel. And if we were to look at different spots, and this is with depth too, and again, with the salt wedge, um, say the Steveson Bend, uh, the Massey Tunnel, which is an issue right now because they're looking at replacing it. So there's a question of what's going to happen with the, uh, with the, the salt behavior and then at the water intake that tasker station is you actually see a difference up the channel depending on the time of year this is model data but it does show that that depth dependency in terms of the salinity content so what does that mean for irrigation well there's different levels different i guess appropriatenesses of water of what what can be applied on the crops now um, there's a lot of words on the left there that 
look at the different standards, but generally there's a couple of ways of, of measuring the, um, the salinity of the water. There's concentration, which is the micro Siemens per centimeter, which is what you see, um, or you can do um, uh, total dissolved solids, um, actual parts per million, parts per billion. But I'm gonna use um, the uh, conductivity here. So in the upper right, you can see that anything under, and that these these are approximate ranges. They, there's a lot of factors in them, but um, these are the ones that a lot of the, from the, the literature is what I use. Under 400 uh, microsiemens per centimeter, it's considered suitable for all crops. That's excellent water. Um, you know, even tap water is probably gonna be in that two to 300 uh, microsiemens. So it's excellent water can go on any crop. Once you start inching higher in terms of the salinity content, um, over 400, between 400 and 800. Um, it's good for most crops. Um, there's a few sensitive ones, uh, like the cranberry strawberries that might have, have troubles. And then as you get up, there's fewer crops that are that are um, appropriate to irrigate. So that 800 to 1500, once you're above that 1500, um, only the really salt tolerant crops could be irrigated. So that's where, um, you know, that's where you really have to be careful in terms of your, your salt content when you're irrigating. So I showed you this uh, chart a minute ago with the uh, the flow of the Fraser River during the peak irrigation um, period, and you can see the medium flow. Now let's look at 2023. Um, 2023 was, as as we all know, it was different, just like every year seems to be right now. But 2023 especially was uh, was concerning in that it was a very rapid and early melt. So you can see where that this light gray line hard to see, but that light gray line of the median is sort of how things normally go. And then we can see the different, you know, the probabilities and stuff. But basically 2023, it wasn't a below average melt. There was lots of snow, no, snowpack or you know, reasonable snowpack. And it actually, the flow early on was above the median, but it was so quick that it just, it just melted. And then by the time we reached, say that normal median time, so that mid-June time, we were already at basically record low flows. So if you look at throughout last year's irrigation season, we went from basically the entire time during that period, we were below historic levels. And we're talking like since 18, or sorry, since 1912. So you know, 110 years type thing. So um, very, uh, very odd year. Now I mentioned that we are measuring the salinity and this is basically the, the project that, that um, that we've been working on for the last two or three, three or four years now, is to be able to measure the salinity. That's the first thing. So, so farmers know, so that the city knows when they bring the water in, what the what the salinity is throughout the canals. Because if a farmer's bringing in the water, they need to know um, what they're putting on their field. They may have a handheld um, salinity tester, but in this case, what we've done is we put um, constant long-term um, sensors with data loggers on them. So basically, we have all the information real time. Um, through at this point, we're at about 26 monitoring points throughout the uh, throughout the system. Now um, we saw 2023. Uh, this also shows 2022, which you can see was um, <laughs> pretty pretty nice in terms of it was actually a later than normal melt. If you look again from the median, probably about two weeks later, but it was a, a sustained peak well above the median. So uh, you can see where the the flow was throughout, you know, really until late fall. Um, at least you know, late October, it was pretty much for the most part above average or above median. So 2022 was, you know, in terms of the, the runoff and everything, it was a really good year, but comparing it to 2023, it really, you can see a contrast. So because we have some of this long-term data, I've done some comparisons here. Now um, that task of intake, so that's the one midway up, well, I guess kind of the Northern part of the, uh, of the Delta area where the, the main intake is. If we look at 2022, we can see that the water, the, the quality of the water, so the conductivity or the salinity throughout the season, um, what you're seeing is May through October, it was basically excellent throughout, you know, throughout the entire season, basically until about mid-September, so kind of past that peak irrigation time. So there was an absolutely no issues with water quality the entire, the entire season. Um, the pumps could be turned on anytime, no issues. Yeah, September 17th, where the salinity started to spike. That's as the flow decreased, tidal action took place, and then it, it started to spike up with higher salinity. So at this point, um, they had to be careful when the pumps went on. They don't want to be bringing in bad water. Now look at 2023. We can see that really early on, by about 
you know, early second week in July, we're starting to get bad water. Um, and then a few other episodes, July 23rd, August 7th, and this would really correspond with low well, tide mostly, um, but also with flow. So you can see throughout really that, that main irrigation season, we're getting a lot of saline water. So where the water comes in, they can't just leave the pumps on. They have to be very careful about when the, when the water is good. So we can, it just really demonstrates the difference between the years in terms of what's available for, for water that can actually be applied to the field. Yeah, and there's the typical irrigation period where, again, 2022 was, was extremely open, uh, whereas 2023 was just not at all. Uh, that was the tasker intake. I want to contrast that with Canoe Pass. Now, this is just another one of the monitoring sites we have. This one, um, it's right on the, basically on Westham Island. Um, if anyone's familiar with the area, Westham Island Bridge, it's near there. And as you can see, this is much closer to, to open ocean. It's still within the channel, but it's it's very much affected by, by the ocean and what happens. So if we look at this one, in 2022, we had basically from June to start of August. Um, yeah, about August 8th, we started to have, we had good water. So, um, and this is where the, the West Ham Island is highly dependent on the, the intakes from that area. Um, so basically up until August 8th, there was good water that could go into the canals, be used for irrigation. Um, and then it had to be, basically they had to be a little bit more careful about when they let, let the water in. If we look at 2023, um, I would say it was really disastrous in terms of what was available for water in that whole area. By about June, which is really pre-irrigation season, um, the water had really turned bad by that point. Um, as you can see, should have mentioned earlier, the scale here, um, I believe it goes up to, uh, it's, well, I think it's 1500 here, that was 2000. But anyway, basically, once it gets off the chart here, is what I kept here just to keep it consistent. The water is, it's really unusable. It shouldn't, shouldn't be applied to the crop. So essentially from pretty much June 7th and then you know a couple of little, little windows, but June 18th on for the rest of the season, there was no water. So there were some farmers that had to just make the decision that we're not gonna water a crop and um, you know there's nothing they can do about it. So it really changed the management, obviously changed the, uh, the result in terms of yield quality, that type of thing. So huge impact for the, for the growers in that area. So just to go back in terms of um, the tool itself. So this sort of goes to the extension part of it is with this network, um, what's been developed over the last couple of years is a information system for the growers. So in this case, it's an online system that the growers can, can access from anywhere, um, desktop, mobile, whatever. And they can see exactly what's happening at any given point. So for each of these, each of these monitoring sites, they can see that's updated every 15 minutes. They can see exactly what the salinity is. This one I think is from, I don't have a date on here, but this would be sometime during the winter. You can see the values are very high, except for some of the, maybe some of the in-channel ones that aren't bad. But um, and it, it ranks in terms of here's the salinity and then is it safe for irrigation, is it safe for salt tolerant crops, safe for most crops, that type of thing. So it's a very, very easy way to, to instantly get information on what's going on within the system. And um, particularly you can zoom down to where you're concerned about where you're pulling water. Um, so there's searchable has the salinity ratings, as I mentioned, and then it has the clickable zoomable map where a grower can click on the map and get more details. So when they do that, um, they can, uh, you know, in this case, for instance, here's Westham Island with some of the intakes being uh, being monitored. They can see exactly what's going on. Um, you can see some of these crazy high numbers. This would be uh, more recently. Um, typical ocean waters in that 30 to up to 50 or 60,000 um, microsiemens per centimeter. So um, you can see those values are pretty much pure ocean water. And then in terms of the interface for the growers, they can uh, they can get more information, more details, and they can query down to an individual site. So this is if this is a site, this one happens to be um, on 72nd Street, uh, where one of the gates is, they can look and see exactly what the salinity is, what it's been over the past um, 24 hours, seven days, whatever, whatever they want to look at, and get the numbers of um, basically where it is in terms of the salinity content, is it safe to apply to crops? Uh, what's it been? Has it been spiking up? Do I have to be a little bit more careful about when I, when I turn my pumps on? Uh, the other piece of it is we're also measuring the water level. Um, now this comes in handy for actual 
water supply. If there's not enough water in the canals at a certain time, uh, they won't be able to get the water. So they can uh, they can see exactly what's going on in terms of water quality. Um, I'll return to that in a second. But um, the other piece too, and this is sort of my other hat I wear, is the weather station side of it. So in the last um, in the last few months, we've put in a, some new weather stations in the Delta area, actually all around BC, but uh, this is happens to be in the Delta area. So the farmers can access their local weather. So if they go and um, click on that that link, they can see some of the new stations. There's a couple of the original Farm West stations on West of Island and Boundary Bay, but then there's some new ones, so uh, Crescent Island and Ladner and Tawasson. So they can they can get their detailed information in terms of uh, temperature, rainfall, wind speed, wind direction, those types of things. So just more management information for the farmers. This would be um, just one of the sites. I wouldn't say it's a typical site because they're a little bit different, but uh, the, um, the salinity is monitored within the canal and then it goes up to a telemetry system. Um, so the data is uh, wirelessly transferred to uh, a central point where it goes online for the growers. So like I say, this is measuring what's going on as the water's passing through. This is probably a fall picture given the amount of algae in the water. It's a little bit, uh, <laughs> a little bit stagnant at that point. Um, and then, yeah, this is on Mason Street in, in Delta. Um, you can see the salinity throughout the, the time series. So yeah, this is through August. Um, you can see a couple of spikes different times, just depending on what the flow is, what water is being let in and how it's managed. Um, and you can also see the variation of water level throughout the season. Uh, here's another one. This is uh, nearby, another spot with a wireless, uh, well, they're all wireless, but uh, shows the, or measures the salinity at this point too. Here you can see the, um, basically what's going on with the salinity content. Now, this one was interesting though, is because um, it, um, it was, um, one thing that was noticed and one of the farmers called me up and he says, is there any way you can, you can figure out the water levels and see if there's, uh, there's some beavers making, <laughs> making dams in the culverts and it's backing up the, uh, the channels. So I started looking at the data and saw these accumulations in water levels and figured, yeah, we can probably, we can probably figure that out by comparing different locations. So what we saw is that between these two locations, one was downstream of the other, if the delta between the two, the two levels became a certain amount, um, we could uh, set an alarm to say, yeah, there's, there's a blockage in the, the culvert somewhere. Looks like Mr. Beaver's been busy, so they had to go, um, I guess, ask him lightly to leave and then had to do that a few times throughout the season. So just one of those, um, one of those side, side benefits that really wasn't anticipated, but something we could use with the um, with the information. Now, um, just where I want to leave you off is um, not to uh, not to leave anyone with doom and gloom, but just where the situation is right now. We had a, a tough irrigation season last year. Um, honestly, this year, as most people know, is not looking any better from all indications. This is the uh, current water conditions uh, within each each area. The lower Frasers, you know, really the lowest, um, forty seven percent. Well. Uh, Sunshine Coast, South Coast, a little bit, little bit lower, but um, this area very low. The ups, upstream watersheds too. Everything's well above average in terms of um, in terms of percent of normal for moisture. Um, current conditions on the Fraser River. So I showed you the well. You've seen this a few times already, but the the typical hydrograph here, where we're at as of a few days ago, is um, or actually we were below normal but uh, we're actually just slightly below, me, above median right now, but with the current snowpack, um, I, I suspect it's gonna be well below median for the season. Um, the automated snow weather stations right now are showing, as you can see, um, this is since 88, this information, but you can see where the, um, well, where the median is, where the minimum 10th percentile is, we're below that. So again, we're, uh, we're at a very low stage just in terms of snowpack. So where things are looking is, um, there's, there's not going to be a ton of water. So Andy, we have some great questions for you in the Q&A. So I want to make sure we have time to jump into those, if you don't mind. Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, I was just going to give my last couple of slides was ba basically just saying what we're doing on the field scale. Um, and this is something to rush through quickly, easily. Um, we, we are doing some soil moisture monitoring to be able to um, basically work with the farmers for irrigation. To, to make sure that they're using, you know, basically using, optimizing their water use. So here's a soil moisture sensor that, that we've, we've put in quite a few fields as demos and working with a lot of growers. 
and some of what the information looks like. And then finally, um, yeah, just next steps. Uh, we're gonna continue with the network and working with the growers and working with more tools to, to optimize the, um, the program and to, to help the growers with, with um, the irrigation. So with that, the acknowledgements and um, yes, open to questions, absolutely. Great. Thank you so much. And it's really great to see the integration of that salinity water monitoring, the weather monitoring, and then also doing the in-field um, soil moisture monitoring as well. Um, okay, so we have a few questions here for you. And I think the first one I want to ask is, uh, you're talking about salinity, um, but what types of salts are being monitored specifically um, since there's some predominant types of salts that accumulate in soils? So are you looking at that, um, the, the types of salts that will accumulate in soils or sort of salinity, salinity more generally? Right. Yeah, we, we have not looked at all at the types of salts because uh, absolutely like we are measuring basically the water itself in terms of, you know, just the, the absolute um, concentration or the, the conductivity, which relates to the concentration of salts. But yeah, in terms of which salts they are and, you know, how, uh, how persistent they are in soils, that type of thing, we really haven't gone that way. Um, we've done a little bit of, we do have some sensors in the ground with, um, that do measure soil salinity, but again, it's not, it's not specifying in terms of what, uh, you know, what the actual compounds are. It's basically, um, kind of um yeah i guess sort of um generalizing what uh what's in there great and um is there a concern about salt water intrusion as well as the saline irrigation water right um it's um that that is an interesting one because um definitely there are there are um you know the soil there are areas with with soil saline soil issues um you know some of it just because of of irrigating with with saline water which a lot of it can be flushed out but just because if, if you're familiar with the delta area it's a very high water table a lot of areas right now are in you know they're, they're basically puddling because of the water table because it's basically at sea level um some some of the areas are below sea level so um there are issues with um just with salinity overall, which does, you know, it reduces yield. In some cases, it, it does make areas that are entirely non-productive. So yes, it definitely is an issue, even within the canals themselves, because when you do have, like for instance, right now, where you do have the water kind of flowing freely, it is very, very high saline or high salinity. So um, some of that, some of that salt does stay in the canal. So when the water goes through it, it's actually, even if you have really fresh water, it is actually bringing up some of those salts again. So you're, you're not necessarily dealing with, with clean canals there. You can actually pick some up, some salt up. Yeah, great. Thank you for digging into that a little bit more. Um, one of the questions we have is around the use of um, soil amendments. So things that have um, high CEC, so something like charcoal or other kinds of soil treatments that could counter the salt uptake in fields. Is this something that um, is something that's been discussed being used or under consideration, uh, just given kind of the year like we had last year or the year we're likely going to have this coming year? Yeah, well, it's an interesting question and, and honestly not something that, that's really been discussed in terms of, um, you know, for instance, being able to maybe apply more, more water that's higher salinity and be able to counterbalance it with, for instance, soil amendments or even, you know, varieties or different crops that are more salt tolerant. So basically, instead of avoiding the, the salinity, maybe living with it a little bit more, adapting to, to what's available. Because, you know, the reality is there may be some areas where there just isn't enough fresh water available. So definitely an interesting concept, but yeah, honestly, something we, we haven't really uh, explored too much. Great, and I'm gonna close with one more question for you. And for the other questions, we are going to um, have Andy answer them for you and we'll just follow up in the workshop follow-up materials. So the last question I wanna ask Andy um, was around, the, so the graph that you showed for 2023 with the early freshet and steep early drop-off uh, looks like an anomaly. Um, but can you discuss how that could become the norm um, and you sort of like when we can be expecting those situations going forward? Right. Yeah, it's, it's for, for sure. It was it was an anomaly definitely in terms of the long-term record. Um, maybe it's not so much of an anomaly in terms of what we're 
you know, not maybe in the last little while. Um, I think even right now, and, and some of it will depend on different climate scenarios of what is, of what is most likely, but definitely of what's being predicted would be potentially more rainfall than snowfall. So that really affects the snowpack. If there's less snow, then it's, it's more just, you know, it, it doesn't get stored. It, it runs off immediately. So um, definitely changes in that peak. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's, it's, Definitely, I think just where things are going, it's there's going to be differences in flow, you know, whether it looks like a 2023 or back to a 2022, which for in this context wouldn't be a bad thing. Uh, but I think that's uh, you know, probably the, just remains to be seen in terms of what it looks like. Great. Well, thank you so much, um, Andy, for answering those questions and for sharing your work.